Well, welcome back to Barley and Hops. I'm George, and I'm so excited to be here again today. You know, we are close to 100,000 subscribers. So, if you haven't had the opportunity yet, or you've watched several of the videos and you just haven't done so, please just subscribe. Hit the subscribe button below. It costs you absolutely nothing. Plus, we get the credit. That's the best part about it. And uh, we will, sh we should shortly cross that 100,000 subscriber level. So, and thanks to you for making all of that possible. Today, we're going to talk about condensers. Yes, there are so many different methods of condensing your vapor uh, out of your still. Uh, the one that we are normally accustomed to is just, just normal water. Uh, we use water in a condenser. Now, whether that condenser is a coiled piece of copper in a bucket, uh, or whether it's a Liebig condenser, or whether it's a shotgun condenser, uh, and sometimes I get these two confused. I'll call this a shotgun condenser. Uh, oh, it's actually a Liebig condenser. That's the name of it, uh, but I, I kind of liken it to a shotgun barrel. Uh, and a shotgun condenser is a little bit more, uh, not complicated, but a little bit more complex. Uh, it normally has multiple tubes running through the center of it. Um, it that's normally known as a shotgun condenser. Uh, but aside from that, they all do exactly the same thing. They condense the vapor in the column that rises. You see, it rises your uh, vapors. Yeah, rise up the column and they pass through. This is your point of no return. Remember, we talk about that a lot. This is where your vapors exit your column. There we go. That's where you measure your temperature. And they go down through your condenser tube, and then they go into the condenser itself. And of course, cold water goes in the bottom, and it comes out the top. Now, uh, and in this small local, this area right here is where all of that vapor is condensed from that high temperature to a low temperature, and that low temperature causes it to turn back into a liquid. Huh, and it runs out here. So we all know how that works. Now, here are a couple of questions, and a lot of times our videos are based on the preponderance of emails and or comments um, that, that we get over a period of time that kind of lets me know that we, we've got a little bit of confusion or interest in a certain area, so we, I like to try to tailor the video or the videos that are coming uh, to try to answer those, because if five or ten people or, or hit me up with a question about one thing, chances are there are a lot more people out there that have the same question. So, what is the temperature, what is the necessary temperature to operate your condenser? Well, think about this, okay? Do you, do you do know what the temperature is in your column because I know you're tracking it with a thermometer. Now, whether that be a PID, whether it be a thermometer, whether it be a dial thermometer, a digital thermometer, makes no difference, okay? You know what the temperature is, and you know what the temperature is supposed to be, and it should be above, at or above, the vaporization point for ethanol. Uh, and it should be way below the vaporization point for water because you don't want to just push water through there. So, that's somewhere around 174-ish, you know, give or take. Some stills run at 184, some run at 186. Uh, it, it all depends on your still and how you're running it. Uh, so what does the temperature have to be in the condenser in order to turn that back into a vapor? Well, it has to do with two, really two things. It has to do with the ability for your water to transfer that thermal energy that's inside the tube uh, into the water and the water flow back out uh, and also the temperature of the water itself. A rule of thumb, okay, So, because there's, there's so many variables. You know, what, How many cubic inches of space do you have in here? What's the volume of flow? What's the flow rate? What's the temperature? A good rule of thumb is the temperature of that water should be a little less than about half the temperature of the vapor, okay? So if you're at 100, and, let's say you're at 180 degrees, uh, your cooling temperature should be 90 degrees or below. All right. Now normally, uh, we don't, a lot of times we use tap water. Uh, tap water that comes out of your out of your uh, uh, sink, out of your faucet, uh, is normally cool enough. Okay. I, I I can't think of almost any place where it's 90 degrees uh, coming out of your tap. Uh, there may be some exceptions. I got you. Okay. But uh, as long as it's below 90 degrees, you're, you're going you're going to 
condense the vapors that are in this tube and turn them back into a liquid. Now, it leads me to the next question. Is colder better? Well, no, all your, well, yeah. Uh, let, me, let me say this in a roundabout way that really should really make sense. If the water used in your condenser isn't cold enough, okay, it's not cool enough to fully condense the vapors that go in here and come out here, what happens is, is you wind up with a lesser proof because you're losing vapor, okay? If it's not fully condensing. So that does have an impact on strength in a roundabout way, but it's a direct correlation. You see, if you're not fully condensing, it's just like not condensing at all, uh, and all you're doing is you're your steam is just running out and it's not a liquid any longer so it's not dropping out it's just kind of taking off uh, so that is one aspect but let's say for instance that you're hell-bent you're like well I want to get that water down to like 38 degrees because when I make it 38 degrees it makes it taste better well it the temperature of your cooler does not have any effect on the flavor um, there's very little you can do, virtually nothing you can do to the flavor of your spirit as it's traveling up the column and then through here with the exception of a gin basket. Uh, but let's say setting that aside, uh, once it gets here, it's, it's going to taste the way it's going to taste, whether it condenses or not. Uh, if it comes out of here and you could taste that vapor, that vapor is going to taste the same as that condensed liquid's going to taste. You, you follow me? So just because you've got it going colder does not necessarily mean it's going to be better. So why do we chase the temperature in the water? Well, there's really, see, you have a couple of options here. One is you can just run the tap water. You can run a hose in here and you turn the tap water on full and run the water out here. And so what are you doing? You're just, you're, wa you're actually wasting water. So those who are a little bit more conservative with their water usage and the cost associated with running a still for sometimes three to four hours, depending on the size, uh, sometimes it's not as cost effective to just run the tap full blast. So what do we do? We find more ingenious ways in order to operate this condenser. All right. Now we haven't even talked about the reflux chamber yet. All right. And we're not going to cover the reflux chamber today. Not in this video. We're going to cover it in the next video. Now, so we came up with some ingenious ideas and ways to do that. One is you get a container. I have, I happen to have, this is, I believe this is a 96 quart. It's, it's a BAC. It's a big ass cooler. Okay. Um, it, the reason I use this big ass cooler is because I can fill it with a lot of water and I can put this pump in it. This is like a pond pump. I got this from brew house. They're like 29 bucks. Uh, and this thing pumps, it's rated at 529 gallons per hour, all right? Uh, and that's enough because it's got a great, what it's called, uh, head, oh gosh, how high it will pump. Um, and this is like eight feet. This thing is a pretty pretty substantial pump. Uh, it's 120 volts submersible. It just You drop it in the water and it just pumps water out. Now, you drop one of these inside one of those full of water, and you just recycle the water. So you run it into the condenser and then out of the condenser back into the cooler. That solves a problem of wasting water. But what happens to that? Well, the water that goes into the condenser, remember, is picking up heat. And as it's picking up that heat, it's coming back out, it, turns, it winds up being hot water coming out. So that'll actually change the temperature inside your collection vessel that you're circulating water from. So another great idea, we start adding ice to it. So you just keep the water in the cooler cool and you just keep adding hot water to it and the ice again cools the water and then you're pumping water back through, cold water, hot water comes out, goes back into the cooler, turns into cold water, cold water is pumped out and you got that cycle going. Now that becomes not cost prohibitive, but that can become expensive and you're, gosh, it'll take me sometimes if I'm running a, an eight gallon still, I may have to go through 40 or 50 pounds of ice. Um, so I had to resolve that too. 
There, of course, there are many, many different methods. Uh, one other thing about pumps, I want to show you this. This is a smaller pump, whoops, a smaller version. And you'll know, you can, you can see immediately the difference in size of these things, what this one's capable of pumping as opposed to what this one's capable of pumping. <sighs> ah, this one will work. Oh, by the way. And they usually run about oh, anywhere from 11 to 19 bucks. Uh, but the only difference is, is that this one doesn't have that ability to pump really high. So you've got to put it on level with your still and pump across. So you can pump over uh, and that'll, that'll work extremely well. But now you've got to move your water source high. Uh, if you want to run your water source from a low portion and just pump it up to your still, then I'd recommend you get a larger pump. Okay. You can get these on brew house. Uh, it, Amazon has them. Oh uh, my goodness, it just, just Google water pumps, pond pumps, uh, and you'll be able to get that. And they're pretty durable, <laughs> okay? Now, <laughs> the solution I came up with, and I, I did a video on this to show people how I built this, but I wanted to give you a, a little bit more of a close-up view of this because there's still some confusion about this. Right now, uh, I've got a thermometer in here. And right now, the water temperature inside this cooler is 59 degrees, and it's been there for about an hour. Um, it stayed at 59 degrees. Uh, when I filled this up with water, it was 79 degrees. And I used this old, I had an air conditioner, I had a 5,000 BTU air conditioner sit in the corner of the shed uh, that I was getting ready to toss out. And I had, I went, bing, I had an idea. Actually, someone shared it with me, and I went, bing, there's idea just validated because someone shared it with me and then I went oh maybe I can do that and uh, so I mounted the air conditioner on top of the cooler and the evaporator coil that used to sit right here with the squirrel cage fan and see this is where the air would have blown the cold air would have blown out I actually and carefully bent that evaporator down so now it sits down here in the water and the heat exchanger, which is the other coil on the back side, is where the heat is dissipated from the heat picked up out of the water through that evaporator. And it blows that heat off and it pumps it right back through, through this metering valve, which you have high pressure, low pressure. And for those who understand that, when it comes to Freon, um, your coolant that's inside this system, uh, high pressure, Pressure and temperature is proportionate. When it's high pressure, it is extremely hot. When it's low pressure, it's extremely low. So you have a really large, they call it the delta, the real large differential between the temperature of the liquid going in and the temperature of the liquid after that valve. So it sprays into the evaporator and then it picks up all that heat. All that heat is picked up and it's pumped right back through this compressor and it pumps it out through the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger removes all of that initial heat off of that. It repressurizes it, and then it runs it through that metering valve. And so that's how it actually works. So really, that's how an air conditioner works. So what I did was, is I, I, I took all the stuff off of here that I really didn't need. Um, and I know this looks like ass, but I've been using this now for over a year. Uh, and every time I run a still, I use it. It works extremely well. Uh, I plug it in, turn it. I've got it wired so that when I plug it in, it comes on. Uh, I went the most simple, direct route. I bypassed the thermometer, or yeah, the thermometer on the control panel. And so this knob, all that knob does is turn the fan on. Uh, when I plug it in, the compressor comes on and I've bypassed everything else. Uh, that I really don't need because I didn't want to control the temperature. I just wanted to get cold and then turn it off and stay cold for a while. So this takes about, I've got uh, probably 15, 16 gallons of water in here. And within about 30 minutes, I dropped it from 79 degrees to 59 degrees. And I'll keep it there. Uh, and, and I'll run my still off of this and I'll pump it out. I've got one pump already inside with an exit hose. And that runs to the still, and then here's the return hose where it runs back in. It, so it cycles right back into the uh, cooler. Um, and I'll run that, and after about 45 minutes or so, uh, the temperature on here should it'll start to increase. It'll get up to like 65, 67, 68, and I'll just turn it back on for 
10 or 15 minutes and drop the temperature back down. Now, why do I go to like 59 degrees? I, I could go a lot lower. Now, the only thing that does is it preserves the water and I don't have to use any ice. You see, and the only reason you use ice is to preserve the water. Um, because without that, without a means to cool the water that you're going to run through the condenser, uh, you would have to replace that water because the water's too hot. What happens when the water goes through your condenser and that water is too hot? If it goes in here, too hot. We're back to the very beginning, my friends. We're not fully condensing in the condenser and we're starting to lose that vapor. That's how simple that is. And uh, that should answer almost all or most of the questions. Um, these things are really easy to build. Uh, all it is is take a couple of things off and uh, carefully bend over the evaporator so it's submerged in the water. Uh, yes, you're going to ruin it. You're never going to use it as an air conditioner again. But, you know, then again, you know, uh, some people have these things laying around in the garage that they pulled out of a window somewhere or someone was going to throw away or they're going to give, you know, whatever the case may be. They're, they're readily available and they really do a good job of cooling that much water pretty quickly and maintaining it that way. So I just share that with you. That's just a really good tip and a good point for how to operate a condenser. So in a nutshell, uh, condensers. Uh, rule of thumb should be less, a little less than half the temperature of your vapor as it's exiting your column or your still, okay? Headed towards your condenser itself. So it should be a little bit less than half the, the temperature. Uh, that's in order to condense efficiently. So all we're trying to do is do an efficient job of condensing whatever that distance may be. If your condenser is really short, you need a cooler water source uh, in order to do that job because remember it, that water is going to pick up all of that heat as it's condensing that vapor into a liquid and if it picks up all of that heat and there's not enough or the, the the water temperature is not cold enough it won't do that in a short period the longer your condenser really the warmer your water could be because it's got such a longer way to flow and there's more of a volume flowing through there. So it has a lot longer period of time and it can carry a lot more heat. So keep that in mind. We're talking about efficiency, temperature, and actually just process. Remember, your technique is totally up to you. Just don't violate the principle. And the principle is to convert a vapor back into a liquid. Happy distilling.